All right. <clears throat> if I get all your attention, we uh, have uh, ready for our second virtual lunch speaker uh, today. Um, and again, like yesterday, um, if you, we're going to have a brief presentation and then there'll be time for a question and answer. So if you just hold your questions, make a note of them. Um, but if you have any, notice any technical issues that I don't notice, if you can't hear uh, or see, let me know and I will try to address that. Uh, and I'm going to hand this over to Tammy to introduce our guest speaker here today. So it is my great pleasure to introduce you to uh, Jeff Stratter. He works at the Salmon Public Library. He is an alum of the Make It program. Um, we met Jeff a couple years ago when he attended the Make It program. And he has kind of taken make it in a lot of different areas, but lately he has been really focused on design thinking. So we thought it would be to have him come and share some design thinking thoughts he has, how it relates to libraries through his lens, and what he has actually been doing with customers in his community as a library uh, representative with design thinking. So, everybody, a round of applause for our guests. All right. Um, I will just start the screen share here so you all can see the presentation. And hopefully, Dylan just gives me a thumbs up again to make sure that we are rolling. Everyone see that? Yes. Looks good. Okay. So as Tammy said, my name is Jeff Stratter and I work at the Salmon Public Library in Salmon, Idaho. Uh, I'm by no means an expert at design thinking. I'm just a library assistant that's seen an opportunity to use this process at our library. So I hope to give you some insight to what this might look like when you go uh, back to your libraries. And I'm really happy to see, again, all the librarians that signed up for Make It training this year. Um, as Tammy mentioned, uh, put things in perspective, I was sitting in that same seat two years prior at the Make It training cohort of 2016. I had no idea what making was, uh, nor was I a librarian. I mean, I worked at a library, but it was literally just a job to pay the bills and keep me occupied at the time. Uh, I'm still getting a hold now of what making is, and I'm still not really a librarian. So not too much has changed in two years, but that's not entirely true because if it were true, I wouldn't be here today, uh, invited by Tammy, Sue, and Dylan to speak with you on design thinking. So basically, if you're there sitting you know, today feeling overwhelmed, questioning how does this fit into my library or my site, don't worry, it doesn't need to make sense. Uh, it will make sense. You see, when uh, Salmon Library uh, started, we didn't have a division of STEM programming. Uh, we didn't have making in any form or any programs beyond a preschool reading hour and summer reading for the youth. <clears throat> that makes sense because we're a library, right? We don't do STEM, that's for schools. Well, in comes Make It at the Library and my world is blown. We try out all sorts of new STEM tools, robots and programming, and it's a huge hit. We went from circulating books to now offering engaging youth programming. Jeff, we're having, having a couple connectivity issues on your side, I mean on our side. I'm gonna try switching over to a different internet, internet connection real quick. Um, so if we lose you, I'm gonna call you right back, okay? Will do. Sorry. Okay, we'll see if this. Yeah. Hello. Um, ah, because we don't want to waste the food. So if you want some more, feel free to get it. Can you get a drink for later on? Jeff? Yeah. Water? Are you? Still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, good. We're on a different connection. I'm, I'm hopeful that this will make it so everyone can hear you now. We were just having some issues with the audio dropping out, and I think it was our side. Uh, so okay. uh, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, please, please continue. Okay. So when we started Salmon Library, we didn't have any division of STEM programming uh, or making in any forms or programs really beyond a preschool reading hour or summer reading for our youth. Because uh, that makes sense. We're a library, and we're not really... Um, doing STEM, that's for schools. But in came Make It at the Library, and my world was blown. We, we tried new STEM tools, robots, and programming, and it was a huge hit for our community. We went from circulating books to now offering engaging youth programming. But something was still missing. There was an element, the cloud that you see above, that was carrying this whole ship, but I didn't know what it was. 
So I guess it ultimately comes down to how do you view libraries? Is a library's sole mission to build a collection and encourage literacy? But what about digital literacy? Or how does the 21st century library act and function? What are we doing as librarians to continue to encourage the next generation to become lifelong patrons? And how will they use the space? So if you've asked questions like these, congratulations, you started on the path to design thinking. That unknown cloud for me was design thinking. Uh, design thinking is a strategy to help us define solutions for problems as experienced by our users. Design is everything. We move from thinking of ourselves as designers to thinking of ourselves as thinkers. It's an approach to problem solving. See, design thinking is often confused with visual design. It's not what it looks like or what it feels like. It's actually how it works. So for some libraries and staff, this will be an easy process. For others, it will seem foreign and uncomfortable. But for either of you, if you go through this process, not only will you find your team bonds closer together, but you'll be creating a more efficient, creative, and user-oriented library for you and your patrons. So as a quick review, as I'm sure you've gone over this in the last design jam session that you just came from, um, but here's, here's a design thinking so far. It's the basic workflow, and this can vary from different online sources, but it's empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. Now, my immediate gut reaction in this process is, how does that fit in with a library? I mean, I hear words like empathize and prototype, the words that typically don't get thrown around with the daily workings of your circulation, volunteer management, or other things librarians are asked to do. And you're right, they don't, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't. Uh, just because you're a librarian doesn't mean you aren't a designer. You are. You design an experience for the patrons that walk through your door. You design processes that help your coworkers become more efficient. You run programs that engage with the community. You solve problems. You design all the time. One of the most misleading things I found when discovering design thinking in both trying to teach it and uh, to our youth and employ it at the library was that design thinking had to be about creating a product or a physical thing. Uh, it doesn't and it shouldn't. Design thinking can help us with how we use space to create better systems for our staff and patrons. So enough talk, let's walk through the process together and see what it could look like at your library in terms of using it with your staff. I'm gonna show you an example of how our library used it, uh, along with providing some methods to incorporate for when you get back to your libraries. And later I'll show you how we're using it um, within our youth programming. So the first step is empathize. Uh, I put down some methods here below uh, that you might want to look into further. Perhaps you went over some of them already. Uh, it depends really on the general issue you're trying to get feedback on for which method you're going to use. One of the key elements you want to remember when doing this process at your library is to avoid bias. Working anywhere long enough, we develop a preconceived notion as to what the problem is and how we're going to solve it. That's not using the design process, uh, but actually just solving a problem that we've already determined. So for our library, we wanted to get more information on why high school students weren't using the library for our younger patrons, like our younger patrons, sorry. So we set out with, to empathize with them. Uh, I caught a few of these high school students you see in the photo in our library on a few occasions, went over and chatted with them. Uh, we continued this process whenever we could, either in the library or outside in the community to get a better sense of what it's like to be a teen in Salmon. What do they do? Where do they go? Why? Uh, what's fun for them? What do they wish they were learning in school? Questions like that, very general um, questions to get feedback. Um, empathy works best. In, can you hear? Are you guys, I hear some chatter there. Is it all right? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Uh, empathy works best in situations where you've already built up a trust with your audience. So choosing teens or patrons for that matter that are willing to truly let you into their world will result in better feedback and uh, results um, get better as you move into the defined stage. All this was in hopes to gather data from them. But with one, uh, but with one-on-one -on -one interviews and observation from our staff and teachers or other community members that play a role in our teens' lives, maybe the library can provide a solution for a need that might not be met by these teens. So we took that information that we got from them and we went down to the defined stage. We put down all of our thoughts on different color post-its using certain colors to identify how we got that information. Uh, was it through an interview, a survey, 
um, or observation, just to be clear where our data came from. As you can see here on the left, we started to form buckets. Uh, we found information we were gathering overlapped. In our case, we saw a very distinct pattern of lack of hands-on engagement, ability to be social with peers, a uh, place to hang out, and certain skills that were desired but not being offered in the schools. What we ended up with was enough data to create a point of view statement. It allows us, for example, to see that our user group, which was high school teens, needed hands-on engagement because it helped them learn skills not offered in schools. When doing this process, you'll probably find that you're going to create a number of point of view statements out of the data you gather. So it's a good opportunity to use this voting method to determine which point of view statements you want to give the most value to carry through to the next phase of the process. I'm going to just step back real quick. Um, I just want to mention here this app where the Wild Books app is an app by Harvard, um, I think Harvard University, and it's an app you can put on your phone to track um, users throughout your library and where they're going. It might help you with the design process you're trying to use. And the other resource there, Photo Journaling, is a step by step process of how to do photo journaling in your library. So, ID8 phase. We took our point of view statements into the ID8 phase where we had a lot of different methods to choose from, as you can see. I think I saw on the wall there, you guys did some of these already earlier. Uh, for us, we chose mind mapping to create a need statement. Uh, ours was teens need a space uh, for hands on engagement. From there, we brainstormed different ways this might look, feel, and act like. From there, we tried brainwashing. I really enjoyed this method because it was timed. We used three minutes and it forced us to ideate quickly and rapidly. It didn't allow us to stun our own ideas. Then each staff member that came in to the next poster had a harder time putting new information down, which made it really engaging process. Our posters for this space that we used um, in developing were, what's the values of hands on user groups we hoped would use it and learning outcomes we desired from this space. And as you can see from that, we, with each poster, we paired the main themes into overarching themes that would present ideas that we'd like to prototype. Those blue or those uh, green uh, post-its are the main overarching themes that we pulled from each, each uh, brainwalking process. Then we moved on to prototype. So some of the main arching themes that we had were that came out of that session were explore STEM careers and technology, 21st century job skills, and problem solving. So we needed to represent those main themes in a prototype for a teen space from that brainstorm session we just went through. So like most first attempts of prototyping, the key is to drop your perfectionism. You just need to get something on the table in order to manipulate it, whether you're dealing with a system, say represented by some of your or cardboard quick models to move around, because that's going to give you a better idea to what your um, potential solution might feel like. And if you're going to do a, a more of a website design, some wireframing method, the picture in the upper left might help you better. And then some of the methods down below are um, digital versions of those that you could uh, easily research on Google and use to your benefit. So for us, we chose the chalkboard method. We sketched up uh, rough designs and layout for a space that would include uh, solutions to the proposed issues we were trying to solve. From here, we erased a lot. And um, we took that rough chalk sketch into a more formalized graph paper sketch. This gave us a little bit more refined look at the space and context of scale. It was here we continued to poke holes and we're doing a test re-prototype iterative process over and over again before moving on to a more finalized model. So lastly, we took that 2D version and translated into 3D in order to begin some more rigorous testing. The best solution for us was using a product called Google SketchUp. This helped us visualize the space and give new perspective on our solution. So our little test model is to take out to the real world. And sometimes what you'll learn will be difficult to hear, or you're going to uncover even more changes that you need to make in other areas of your library. But that's OK. That's what the testing uh, phase is for. So one of the methods we had was uh, the I like, I wish, what if model. This gave users a format that they could easily understand in which to provide feedback for our model. 
And since we just came out with that uh, fancy 3D version of our model, we got uh, really kind of hit the and exported that model to a phone to use with Google Cardboard and VR goggles so we could present the space to our board and our users. This gave them a full immersive experience without causing us to buy any of the stuff. So not only did they experience new technology um, with the VR goggles, but they also were experiencing our space firsthand. Uh, from there, we took further notes. And hopefully, if the connection works, I will just show you guys. Um, so here is that model of that space that we are designing for our teams. This is actually a design thinking space we're going to place in our meeting room, where we design think the design thinking space really gets confusing. Um, so this is gonna be our brainstorm area where people ideate and use the whiteboards. Then behind there, there'll be a sketch area to take the designs to sketch. Then there's a rapid prototyping area, which they can work hands on. And when they finish prototyping, they'll be able to move on to 3D printing, laser engraver, sewing, woodworking to finalize their prototype. Um, so this is just a, a version of getting that testing phase out there for people to really get hands on with and um, kind of make comments before anything major happens. So lastly, we printed a model of this space. This was one of our last versions. Of this. Um, it was used as a double fold one to be able to teach people about the design thinking process, but also we could move pieces around and people that can experience it via the computer can come up into our space and move pieces around and really test whether these things are going to work out. But every time you think you're done, you're not really done because there's always a, another reiteration necessary. Uh, this is everything in design thinking. It's a continual process to get the best results. We test to find problems in order to make a new prototype. And that's not focusing too hard on perfecting our first prototype. We're looking for ways to improve it. If our test results are so bad that prototype isn't close, it's okay. We go back to the ideation phase and create a new idea. Start from there. If we didn't empathize well, well, we find it, we're going to find it hard to do the divine stage, so we might need to go back and do that again. It's an interactive process that's built, so ultimately the best process is put forth. And like, like us, you might find yourself doing this unconsciously over and over again, especially in the prototype phase, but that's a good thing. And if you have time, this below was a recent uh, webinar on thinking in libraries. It was recorded, so you can go back and watch it if you want. Uh, our own ILA president, Abby Buckingham, presented there, um, representing Idaho libraries and design thinking, which is great. Failures. Well, don't be afraid of failure. It's As a librarian, you know we fail um, a lot of things we try to employ in our library. It's a process, not a competition. There's plenty of opportunities to learn from our mistakes. That's a good thing. This helps you refine your process. Anytime you start something new, you have to expect room for growth. For us, one of the first failures when we decided to begin teaching design thinking to our youth during a uh, maker summer camp was that they, they, they defined the problem as trying to build a slide at the community pool. But what we found was um, it's almost impossible to teach design thinking and employ it at the same time. So you might find this with your staff as well. Something you need to take time to work on certain exercises of empathy or brainstorming, fight off smaller pieces before you try to apply to your library or your youth as a whole. So what happened was it was hard for us to move from phase to phase because that learning gap um, was so big that we couldn't do it all at the same time. And in the upper left, you'll see this was a different version of the design process that we were using, which has since gotten, we've redone that. Um, and these are the youth down here on the right um, measuring the slide that they wanted to build. So um, we reiterated our process to make it better. The next go around, we worked with a grant from Idaho State Action Center who has fabulous grants. If you don't already apply for them, you should. Uh, this one was a project called Bowslam. We were tasked with having youth solve an umbrella problem, such as transportation. I mean, that's a pretty broad topic that seemed perfect for us to use the design process to help define a problem that exists, not one that we wanted to solve. We spent the first six weeks just doing exercises on empathy and defining, brainstorm, redesign, or we even brought the words transportation to them. 
So what this led to is a much higher success rate of the design thinking process. In the upper left, you see how the students out and they conducted personal interviews, phone interviews, surveys, they gathered data on how people use four-wheelers in our community. Four-wheelers was the um, what they wanted to focus on. Then we moved to the defined stage. Uh, we took that data, again, we put it on post-its and color coordinated it. And we found out where our problems overlapped. And we basically created four groups um, from that data, which was weather, navigation, safety, and supplies. Uh, these are the areas that showcased problems um, in numerous parts of the interviews that we did. So then the ideate phase, we combined our ideation phase kind of with our defined stage, and they put up the ideas um, on post-its or on posters to solve problems by which, um, uh, which poster had the most solutions, and they settled on safety. So once we knew we wanted to concentrate on safety, we again, we ideated to come up with a helmet solution where a user would have to wear a helmet in order to start their forward. Uh, then we move to the prototype phase. As you can see, it's just a mess down here, which is perfect for prototyping. We first used cardboard and other hands-on supplies to get a concept of what this system might look like. There was no need to jump into 3D printing or modeling, as it's a waste of time if your system doesn't already work. Uh, remember, you need to drop protectionism by the stage. They work individually here to create different prototypes to which we voted on which model had the best success of being taken forward. Eventually, a system where a helmet would recognize a pressure sensor that it was being worn, and it would transmit a signal to a box that lives on the TV, you would open and release your key in order to start your motor vehicle. So one of the biggest hurdles that we ran into for you, um, providing a solution to a problem that had already been solved. So you might run this, run into this at your library when designing a solution. And there's no reason to spend time in the design thinking process for a problem that's already been solved. Just like this ideation chart for that to encourage more critical thinking skills as they work in different solutions. What problem am I solving? What's my idea? Does it already exist where they found, yes, it does already exist. And if it does, can I improve it? Or can I adapt it? No? Well, then we need to start over. Or um, it doesn't exist. No, but if I have the current knowledge and skills to solve this problem, yes, then let's move on to the next one. So this really helped them break down critical thinking and um, the ideation phase. So testing. After spending some time to work from the cardboard model to our 3D printed model and designing these boxes, we had to test them. We used our testing ground to showcase at FabSlam with other teams and judges to get feedback on the product. From here, we could take these and go back and redesign or even re ideate as necessary on the feedback we got. And we're currently doing that now because they're still working on it, which is a fantastic thing. Uh, we had a great showing to get their idea and showcase their understanding of this process, which resulted in a victory for uh, our youth team. So this was a huge success. This has literally just happened over the last couple of years with this process, but it's giving our youth a critical think solving technique that they can continue to apply in other aspects of their lives. As well for us, we learned more about this process and we can use it for our staff. So that space that we were speaking about in the beginning, that design thinking space that we're creating here, um, that's going to be an actual design thinking space that allows us as a library to walk through our problem, but community members as well. Uh, organizations and different youth to better understand how they can come in and solve problems. We're currently in the process actually of testing this process out with our first guinea pig forest service and the local nonprofit, and they're going to design think how to better engage in terms of their forest plan revision project. So that happens next week. So hopefully we'll take them through that process um, to see what their whole thing is and to see how other libraries are using design thinking. Dylan has queued up a, a video I pulled from the Teton Library and how teens have become active in the design thinking process at their library. So Dylan, if you wouldn't mind. You got it. I will play that video and we'll, uh... We'll uh, let you know when it's done. We'll see you on the other side here, Jeff. So let me get that going.
was a concept presented to the library. We wanted to involve teens in a project creating something for their own space. I mean, to make it theirs. We don't want it. It's not our space. It's their space. Building STEAM is about thinking, making, and doing. We observe, we interview, we get visual, and we make a hit. We've been noticing around the library that it's not the most inviting space, and we just want to get more people in here, get more just cozy feel to the whole area, and hopefully that would make it just a better space for everyone. Just kind of make it, in a sense, welcoming, yet also make the space so you can be productive. And if we can pull off something that does both of those, that would be awesome. And I think that would really encourage myself and my peers to come here more often. Uh, we just went in and talked about all our ideas that we are creating for this team section to help the library out. Honestly, I didn't know what Fab Lab could help me with in the future, what careers I could go on doing. But doing this was actually really helpful, uh, knowing what I could do, help the community, and yeah, give me like ideas. I think it, the presentation turned out better than expected. <laughs> I think that this project has the ability to really get them outside of their comfort zones and have them try on things that they haven't used before. Technologies, tools, learn a new skill, really think about making things in this larger scale. We're using a 4C router to um, I should say print out or engrave um, pieces of our project. Yeah. Yeah. They those in the fixed string screws. Now he's going to put screws in there to hold each part in place. And then he's going to finish cutting all the shapes. We totally had to go through the entire design process, and it helps me realize that it's uh, it's kind of a long process, but you kind of need to go through it to get a good product. Because I know we wouldn't have gotten to where we are without uh, doing it very carefully and methodically. It's really cool to be able to like see it on the computer and but then to actually see it being cut out and like seeing it like I can hold this now. It's it's very uh, it's a very fulfilling feeling. Most people will create a project and be like, oh, I'm just gonna get an easy A on this. What will the people think? Could you want to grow up and be a designer? I can definitely see myself doing something like that. I mean, my mom's an artist, and I love that you can incorporate art into anything. Um, I really have no idea what I, what I want to be, but that's definitely something I could go into. All right, we're back, Jeff. All right. So as you could all see in the video, those, those teens at the Teton Library used the same methodology to approach their own space. They interviewed, they used empathy, they sketched, they prototyped, and then they presented, which was their testing phase, and got feedback and continued to reiterate. So now when we revisit some of those beginning questions we posed about what does a 21st century library look and act like, or how will patrons continue to engage in our space, we can feel more empowered about it changing landscape of technology and need of our patrons that utilize a process like design thinking. It allows us to be flexible, adaptable, and stay up to date to create the future library that makes sense. Uh, I hope you all have a ton of inspiring ideas flowing through your head and what areas of the library you'd like to employ this strategy on, as I can't wait to see what happens. We'll be creating a better website, a new teen area. Maybe that queue at the printer is a bottleneck area. Uh, whatever you choose to solve, know that you're not only a librarian, you are a designer. And thank you. And if there's any questions, I would love to answer them for you guys. I will get back to myself here. Thank you, Jeff. Um, does anybody have any right, questions yeah. about any there of Jeff's are. presentation? OK. My question is, 
question for you is what is the emphasize stage? What does that mean? I mean, I know what empathy means, but what do you mean by em an empathy emphasize around and, and the idea base? I don't know what to say that. Did you hear the question, Jay? I, I, I can hear nothing. Dylan, you're going to have to rehash everything. Oh. <laughs> Happy to do so. Yeah. So the question was, um, and and can you tell us a little more about the um, empathize phase of the of the design cycle and and what that means? I mean, we know what empathy means, but the question was, what can you tell more about that phase specifically? Sure, I think that is the design thinking process. That is the main phase um, and the hardest phase to get right. And in my opinion, the phase that one should probably spend the most time with. If you're doing empathy, um, you're really trying to walk in the user's shoes. Who, who are your users that you're trying to identify? And what is it like for them and their experience? So to get at some of those things, it requires uh, really spending time with your users. Um, that can be through a variety of different methods. If you can just Google uh, empathy and methods to employ empathy, you can go through those methods. But um, keen observation skills, something online, which, which come on, let's see if I, well, maybe I'll share it with uh, Dylan and, and the crew later that they can share with you. There was a point step to empathy. And, um, you know, being sincere, a good listener, observation skills, I forget all the others, but um, it's really just observing um, your user group of, of who you're trying to empathize with. Um, I, that one is the trickiest, for sure. Um, trying to teach teens to empathize is nearly as hard as teaching adults to empathize. It's not a skill we all are just born with, so... Um, I'm still working on that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, the follow up or anything? Okay. She, so, question is: Is whether do you think the empathize part is before or after you come up with the problem? Before. 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 You, you should have you should have a general umbrella problem but not like you should have an area of which you're going to address and the users that use that area. Let's say it's cataloging in your library and like, you know that you have a cataloging problem at your library. Well, how do we better make a cataloging system? Now you need to identify the user groups that use that to empathize with, and they might define the problem within that of what the problem is. Does that, does that make sense? We lost you for a moment, Jeff. We had a connectivity. <laughs> yeah. I was saying you want to defi define a broad problem, like you might want to take a look at cataloging in your library, and you know there's some bottlenecks there. So you want to find the users that use cataloging and identify those users that use your cataloging and then empathize with them, and they will define the actual problem within cataloging that you need to solve. No? Yeah. Maybe. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Good. All right, yeah, other, other questions? Comments for Jeff? And by no means, I, there is no right way. I mean, we're, we're kind of plugging through this and, and failing all the time. So you kind of just work through it. And if, you know, you run into a stumbling block, that's kind of the nature of trying something new at your library and, you know, um, there will be other librarians and other people that are using it. Hopefully, you can continue to ask. You're welcome to email me anytime. Again, I'm not going to say that I have the right answer, but I can provide some of the pitfalls that we've already gone through. Awesome. All right. Uh, yeah. The, so the question you are you are based at the Salmon Library, right, Jeff? Correct. Yes. And. Um, yeah, this is all new for our community and for our library. And most of the time they have no idea what I'm talking about, but they allow me to just continue my reindeer games. <laughs> I, 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 
Did you use the Google Cloud, the virtual glasses? Yeah. Or like what program did you create? Oh, yeah. So, Jeff, there's a question about how you created the, um, using the Google Cardboard, creating that actual virtual uh, uh, projected space. What program or application do you use to create that? Sure. It's a sure. Uh, it's a uh, it's a app called it's actually app app called, it's an uh, online uh, website uh, called um, M O D E L M Modelo is the name of the website. And how I found them is I literally Google searched uh, how to create a virtual space through virtual reality glasses, and this program allows you to upload a model from a software like Google SketchUp, and it will display it. Um, with the left and right eyes that you can put in Google Cardboard, it's really slick. Um, I, I, really great way if you're if you're thinking when you go back to your library, uh, we want to do a space issue or we're trying to concentrate on space. I think that's a great testing model to give people an experience without rearranging your space physically. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Any any other questions? Details. All right. <laughs> oh, there's a comment that you should visit Goldbug, Jeff. Oh yes, every everybody that lived here has sure has visited Goldbug. We stopped visiting Goldbug now because everybody else visits Goldbug. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not going to tell you what the new Goldbug is here in Salmon either. <laughs> No, it, it awesome. really is worth it. That's Goldbug is a hot spring, by the way, for the people that don't know there. And in my experience of hot springs, it's probably the best hot spring I've ever been to and probably the best definitely in the state um, that did a really good job with that. So next year's make a trip. Huh? Hot springs. <laughs> yeah, you can design think how to not have as many people show up to that hot springs. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you, Jeff. I think yes. we'll. Good luck, everybody. I'm sure you're going to do great. And I'm jealous of all the new cool toys that you all have in your library now. Thank you, Jeff, thank you. so much. And, okay. Uh, we'll appreciate it. <laughs> See you next week.